want to invite you to join me on a trip back to the mid-90s to visit my old friend, the PlayStation 1. Not only are the games super inspiring to me as an artist today, but they're also responsible for shaping me into the person I am today. The low-poly, unsynced visuals hit just right and take me back to the soda-fueled all-nighters on the pull-out couch just trying to beat my favorite games like Ape Escape, Metal Gear Solid, or Crash Bandicoot. So when my good buddy and 3D artist Derek Rutkai showed me his latest render, I was blown away and I knew I had to ask him to come on down and share his process with you guys. And speaking of, I think Derek's around here somewhere. Oh, what up Derek? Oh, hey Clint, how's it going? It is fantastic, man. Thanks for coming down. What are we getting into today? Yeah, so I'll kick things off by creating some low-res dithered textures. I'll show everyone how to set up vertex snapping for those nice screen warbles. And finally, I'll cover the render settings to bring it all together while using some of me and Clint's favorite games as reference. So follow me back to the mid-90s. Let's do it. Remember, do not underestimate the power of PlayStation. I have a soft spot for mid-90s video games. 2D sprite work was being perfected with nuance and detail, 3D graphics started to appear on home consoles, and games featured deep immersive stories. There were so many classics from this period of games, and many of them were on the PlayStation. Final Fantasy VII, Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil 2, Crash Bandicoot, and Tomb Raider to name a few. These games had iconic looks, PS1 games had a clear sharp look, they had high res textures and those charming wiggly vertices. So let's take a look at the capabilities of the PlayStation 1 and build an animation in Cinema 4D with this style. In order to recreate the PS1 effect, let's take a look at some of the hardware limitations that were responsible for that mid-90s look, like low poly models, small texture maps, and low render resolution. But there were a few more limitations that were specific to the PS1. The console had an efficient bit depth reduction and dithering process for texture maps, which makes textures look extra compressed and almost noisy on modern screens. Some games used it on everything. Additionally, the PS1 couldn't natively calculate depth, leading to textures sliding and clipping issues. But most iconically, the PS1 couldn't calculate float values, or fractions, relying on integers or whole numbers instead, which caused vertices to snap into place. Now that we understand some of the basics, let's start on our own PS1 style project. I'll start by doing a real rough block out of everything, but we're missing a subject. Luckily for me, I saw the sweet truck, which has major Metal Gear Solid 1 vibes. I can picture it driving through a snowy environment like Shadow Moses Island. I snag a few photos, and now let's hop into Photoshop and start working on the texture. I start by cleaning up and scaling the images. This is a 1K texture map, and it gives me some flexibility with size later on. The PS1 could handle texture maps up to 256 by 256 pixels, but most were 32, 64, or 128 pixels. Once the texture is in a good spot, I'll merge all my layers, copy it to a new document, shrink it to 256 or 128, depending on how much detail I want. I'll also use nearest neighbor interpolation for the resize. This might be overkill, but I really like the sharp, crunchy look of the PS1, and this adds to that. Finally, I save my image with Save for Web Legacy. Like I mentioned earlier, the PS1 could reduce texture maps from 24 to 15 bit color and apply dithering. Dithering is a process of using patterns to reduce banding with limited colors. We are going to bake this dithering into our texture maps. When we select GIF with Save for Web Legacy, we get controls for dithering and the number of colors. Now that is a retro looking texture. And what blows my mind is how small this file is. This file is only 6 kilobytes. In Cinema 4D, I'm using the standard renderer. I make a new material and drop my texture into the color channel. You can also use the luminosity channel if you want absolutely no lighting. For the texture sampling, switch it from MIP to none. MIP map is a process of resampling textures at different scales, which the PS1 couldn't do. Over in the render settings, I turn off anti-aliasing. Now we have a super sharp 3D render, very PS1. The Nintendo 64 actually had anti-aliasing and mint maps, so you can keep those on if you're going in that direction. 
While we're on the topic of textures, there are three other techniques that were super common on the PS1 worth noting. It was very common on the PS1 to use image sequences for particle effects like fire, smoke, and spells. I use a similar process over in After Effects for making image sequences. Here's a fire sim I did in Cinema 4D. In After Effects, I reduced the resolution, toggled the interpolation to nearest neighbor, reduced the frame rate, and use a plugin called Retro Dither to get a similar effect to what we had over in Photoshop. Finally, I export it as an image sequence. Another common technique on the PS1 were sprites. Sprites are 2D images used for key elements like characters, items, and effects. They were high quality, detailed, with minimal increase to polygon count, and just an image or image sequence plastered on a 2D card. The PS1 was home to handcrafted, artisanal sprites. Breath of Fire 3, Symphony of the Night, Final Fantasy Tactics, too many beautiful games to mention. One more iconic technique from the PS1 were pre-rendered backgrounds. These were a high quality render, illustration, or photograph used as a background image. They were a hallmark of the PS1. The PS1 could handle large images, and the CD had the storage space for them. Resident Evil 2, Final Fantasy 7, Parasite Eve, and Chrono Cross made great use of pre-rendered backgrounds. Back in our project, let's fill out the rest of the scene using more low poly geo and the same texturing techniques. For the trees, we will use two perpendicular cards and two horizontal cards. Along with a color channel, we'll use an alpha channel for the outline of the trees. This combination of cards gives us a tree that is readable from all angles with minimal geo. We will use more of these cards for autumnal grasses, rocks, and the snow effects. Autumnal grasses. For the headlights, we will use a simple tapered cube with a dithered gradient texture on the alpha channel. We've got our scene all set up. I'll do a quick animation of the truck rolling in and a slight camera push in. Now it's time to apply arguably the most iconic graphic quirk of the PS1, vertex snapping. So we're in the middle of our ninth 3D community challenge, Kinetic Rush, and a lot of you are diving into 3D for the first time to take on this challenge. So I wanna share a learning resource straight from today's sponsor, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community for passionate creatives who wanna level up together. Whether you're diving into 3D design, visual effects or photography, or wanna learn about producing music or even sewing, Skillshare has thousands of regularly updated premium classes just for you. And each class is broken down into bite-sized sections to accommodate any schedule. So since most of you are using Blender during this challenge, I wanna recommend a couple Blender classes that look pretty sweet. We got a beginner's character class by Southern Shoddy 3D, which covers Blender UI, modeling, texturing, and rendering. We got a class that goes over bringing stylized illustrations to life, also by Southern Shoddy 3D, and a sweet cinematic filmmakers course by Kaiwan Shaban, where he shows you how to make this moody lake scene. But no matter what you want to learn, Skillshare is constantly updating their classes, and they got something for everybody. So the first 500 people to click the link in the description get a one month free trial of Skillshare. So get learning, keep growing, and good luck on the Kinetic Rush 3D Community Challenge. Now, let's get back to the video. This is sometimes called vertex wiggling or vertex wobbling. It is so iconic to the PS1, I've never seen it on another system, and when I see it, I'm sent back in time. The reason for the snapping is because the PS1 couldn't natively calculate float values. Without decimals, vertex positions would be rounded to full integers as they moved creating this wobbly look. Each vertex is being quantized individually, so models would distort in odd ways. What's even weirder, the PS1 didn't have Z-depth, so vertex location was based on screen space. The verts wouldn't snap to world position, but screen position. The end result is vertex snapping, but only as objects move relative to the camera. There are several ways to cheat this in Cinema 4D. One technique that I've seen in some games is just adding an animated noise map to displacement. This is a bit of a different look, but it's easy, really trippy, and references the effect of the PS1. Looking at you, arctic eggs, and your wiggly wiggly people. A way to plus this up in cinema is by using a displacement modifier. Add a solid color to the shader, and add a shader field with a noise map applied. In the noise map, change the type to cell noise, set the space to object, adjust the scale, turn up the contrast, toggle uses environment, and drop the shader field on your camera. Now when you move your object or your camera, you get snappage. 
A more accurate version is an object node setup. This setup quantizes vertex position based on a null. You drop the null on your camera and voila, snappage. Even though we're in world space, by quantizing the distance between each vertex and the camera, we get snapping as a vertex moves in relation to the camera. To me, this is way better than vertex displacement, and it flips that sweet, sweet nostalgia switch in my brain. I put this node setup up on my Gumroad for free, so feel free to click the link in the description to grab it for your PS1 projects. Applying this node setup to the truck scene takes it to the next level. In this rig, I added a grid size and distance multiplier control so I can dial in the look. You can also selectively apply this rig to different objects. In the scene, I'm not applying it to the snow layers. Because this rig is actually distorting geometry, the snapping isn't resolution dependent and we can use any renderer in cinema we want. Now we're ready to render our scene. The PS1 used a range of resolutions. I experiment with this, but I usually start around 420 pixels as my longer dimension, and then go up or down from there. I take it into After Effects, scale it up, add color correction, and we're done. You can apply these techniques to a whole bunch of different animations, so have fun and create some awesome art. I love the PS1 style, but more than that, I love the creative problem solving from artists and developers within its limitations. But because we are using contemporary software, there's a lot to explore with blending some of these techniques with higher resolutions, ray tracing, volumetrics, physics sims, depth of field, and everything that the PS1 devs didn't have access to. Dude, thank you so much for coming down and hooking us up with such a cool video. I've been curious about this one for a long time. Awesome, yeah, thanks for having me. Absolutely, man, and where can people find you online? Yeah, you can check out my Instagram if you just look up Derek Rutke. That's where you can find my work. Also, I do a lot of music, and I did the music for this video. Yeah. You can find that if you look up Aquanaut. Rock on, thank you. I hope to see you back, and uh, I'll definitely be seeing you at camp. Camp will be amazing. All right, man, you want to head back to the 90s real quick? Uh, yeah, yeah, right after you. Whoa. Whoa.